This is the second installment of The Princess Bride, Chapter 1, Part B. There have been five great kisses since 1642 BC, when Saul and Delilah Korn's inadvertent discovery swept across Western civilization. Before then, couples hooked thumbs. And the precise rating of kisses is a terribly difficult thing, often leading to great controversy because Although everyone agrees with the formula of affection, times purity times intensity times duration, no one has ever been completely satisfied with how much weight each element should receive. But on any system, there are five that everyone agrees deserves full marks. Well, this one left them all behind. The first morning after Wesley's departure, Buttercup thought she was entitled to do nothing more than sit around moping and feeling sorry for herself. After all, the love of her life had fled. Life had no meaning. How could you face the future? Etc., etc. But after about two seconds of that, she realized that Wesley was out in the world now, getting nearer and nearer to London. And what if a beautiful city girl caught his fancy while she was just back here moldering? Or worse, what if he got to America and worked his jobs and built his farm and made their bed and sent for her? And when she got there, he would look at her and say, I'm sending you back. The moping has destroyed your eyes. The self-pity has taken your skin. You're a slobby looking creature. I'm marrying an Indian girl who lives in a teepee nearby and is always in the peak of condition. Buttercup ran to her bedroom mirror. Oh, Wesley, she said. I must never disappoint you. And she hurried downstairs to where her parents were squabbling, 16 to 13, and not past breakfast yet. I need your advice, she interrupted. What can I do to improve my personal appearance? Start by bathing, her father said. And do something with your hair while you're at it, her mother said. Unearth the territory behind your ears. Neglect not your knees. That will do nicely for starters, Buttercup said. She shook her head. Gracious, but it isn't easy being tidy. Undaunted, she set to work. Every morning she awoke, if possible, by dawn, and got the farm chores finished immediately. There was much to be done now with Wesley gone, and more than that, ever since the Count had visited, everyone in the area had increased his milk order. So there was no time for self-improvement until well into the afternoon. But then she really set to work. First, a good cold bath. Then, while her hair was drying, she would slave after fixing her figure faults. One of her elbows was just too bony, and the opposite wrist was not bony enough. And exercise what remained of her baby fat. Little left now, she was nearly 18. And brush and brush her hair. Her hair was the color of autumn. And it had never been cut, so a thousand strokes took time. But she didn't mind, because Wesley had never seen it clean like this. And wouldn't he be surprised when she stepped off the boat in America? Her skin was the color of wintry cream. And she scrubbed her every inch well past glistening. And that wasn't much fun, really. But wouldn't Wesley be pleased with how clean she was as she stepped stepped off the boat in America? And very quickly now, her potential began to be realized. From 20th, she jumped within two weeks to 15th, an unheard of change in such a time. But three weeks after that, she was already 9th and moving. The competition was tremendous now, but the day after she was 9th, a three-page letter arrived from Wesley in London, and just reading it over put her up to 8th. That was really what was doing it for her more than anything. Her love for Wesley would not stop growing and people were dazzled when she delivered milk in the morning. Some people were only able to gape at her, but many talked, and those that did found her warmer and gentler than she had ever been before. Even the village girls would nod and smile now, and some of them would ask after Wesley, which was a mistake unless you happen to have a lot of spare time, because when someone asked Buttercup how Wesley was, well, she told them. He was supreme as usual. He was spectacular. He was singularly fabulous. Oh, she could go on for hours. Sometimes it got a little tough for the listeners to maintain strict attention, but they did their best, 
since Buttercup loved him so completely. Which was why Wesley's death hit her the way it did. He had written to her just before he sailed for America. The Queen's pride was his ship, and he loved her. That was the way his sentences always went. It is raining today, and I love you. My cold is better, and I love you. Say hello to horse, and I love you. Like that. Then there were no letters. But that was natural. He was at sea. Then she heard. She came home from delivering the milk, and her parents were wooden. Off the, co the Carolina coast, her father whispered. Her mother whispered, without a warning, at night. What? From Buttercup. Pirates, said her father. Buttercup thought she'd better sit down. Quiet in the room. He's been taken prisoner then? Buttercup managed. Her mother made a no. It was Roberts, her father said. The dread pirate Roberts. Oh, Buttercup said. The one who never leaves survivors? Yes, her father said. Quiet in the room. Suddenly, Buttercup was talking very fast. Was he stabbed? Did he drown? Did they cut his throat asleep? Did they wake him, do you suppose? Perhaps they whipped him dead? She stood up then. I'm getting silly. Forgive me, she shook her head. As if the way they got him mattered. Excuse me, please. With that, she hurried to her room. She stayed there many days. At first, her parents tried to lure her, but she would not have it. They took to leaving food outside her room. She took bits and shreds, enough to stay alive. There was never noise inside, no wailing, no bitter sounds. And when she at last came out, her eyes were dry. Her parents stared up from their silent breakfast at her. They both started to rise, but she put a hand out, stopped them. I can care for myself, please. And she set about getting some food. <clears throat> they watched her closely. In point of fact, she had never looked so well. She had entered her room as just an impossibly lovely girl. The woman who emerged was a trifle thinner, a great deal wiser, an ocean sadder. This one understood the nature of pain, and beneath the glory of her features there was a character and a sure knowledge of suffering. She was 18. She was the most beautiful woman in a hundred years. She didn't seem to care. You're all right? her mother asked. Buttercup sipped her cocoa. Fine, she said. You're sure? her father wondered. Yes, Buttercup replied. There was a very long pause. But I must never love again. She never did. Chapter 2. The Groom But first, some comments from the author. This is my first major excision. Chapter 1, The Bride, is almost in its entirety about the bride. Chapter 2, The Groom, only picks up Prince Humperdinck in the last few pages. This chapter is where my son Jason stopped reading, and there is simply no way of blaming him. For what Morgenstern has done is open this chapter with 66 pages of Florinese history. More accurately, it is the history of the Florinese crown. Dreary? Not to be believed. Why would a master of narrative stop his narrative dead before it has much chance to begin generating? No known answer. All I can guess is that for Morgenstern, the real narrative was not Buttercup and the remarkable things she endures, but rather the history of the monarchy and other such stuff. When this version comes out, I expect every Florinese scholar alive to slaughter me. Columbia University has not only the leading Florinese experts in America, but also direct ties to the New York Times book review. I can't help that, and I only hope that they understand my intentions here are in no way meant to be destructive of Morgan Stern's vision. End of author's comments. Prince Humperdinck was shaped like a barrel. His chest was a great barrel chest, his thighs mighty barrel thighs. He was not tall, but he weighed close to 250 pounds, brick hard. He walked like a crab, side to side, and probably if he had wanted to, <coughs> wanted to be a ballet dancer, he would have been doomed to a miserable life of endless frustration. But he didn't want to be a, a ballet dancer. He wasn't in that much of a hurry to be a king, either. Even war, at which he excelled, 
took second place in his affections. Everything took second place in his affections. Hunting was his love. He made it a practice never to let a day go by without killing something. It didn't much matter what. When he first grew dedicated, he killed only big things, elephants or pythons. But then, as his skills increased, he began to enjoy the suffering of little beasts too. He could happily spend an afternoon tracking a flying squirrel across forests or a rainbow trout down rivers. Once he was determined, once he had focused on an object, the prince was relentless. He never tired, never wavered, neither ate nor slept. It was death chess, and he was international grand master. In the beginning, he traversed the world for opposition. But travel consumed time, ships and horses being what they were, <clears throat> and the time away from Florin was worrying. There always had to be a male heir to the throne. As long as his father was alive, there was no problem. But someday his father would die, and then the prince would be the king, and he would have to select a queen to supply an heir for the day of his own death. So, to avoid the problem of absence, Prince Humperdinck built the Zoo of Death. He designed it himself <clears throat> with Count Rugen's help, and he sent his hirelings across the world to stock it for him. He, it was kept brimming with things that he could hunt, and it really wasn't like any other animal sanctuary anywhere. In the first place, there were never any visitors, only the albino keeper, to make sure the beasts were properly fed, and that there was never any sickness or weakness inside. The other thing about the zoo was that it was underground. The prince picked the spot himself in the quietest, remotest corner of the castle grounds, and he decreed there were to be five levels, all with the proper needs for his individual enemies. On the first level, he put enemies of speed, wild dogs, cheetahs, hummingbirds. On the, on the second level belonged the enemies of strength, anacondas and rhinos and crocodiles of over 20 feet. The third level was for poisoners, spitting cobras, jumping spiders, death bats galore. The fourth level was the kingdom of the most dangerous, the enemies of fear, the shrieking tarantula, the only spider capable of sound, the blood eagle, the only bird that thrived on human flesh. Plus, in its own black pool, the sucking squid. Even the albino shivered during feeding time on the fourth level. The fifth level was empty. The prince constructed it in hopes of someday finding something worthy, something as dangerous and fierce and powerful as he was. Unlikely, Still, he was an eternal optimist, so he kept the great cage of the fifth level always in readiness. And there was really more than enough that was lethal on the other four levels to keep a man happy. The prince would sometimes choose his prey by luck. He had a great wheel with a spinner, and on the outside of the wheel was a picture of every animal in the zoo. And he would twirl the spinner at breakfast, and wherever it stopped, the albino would ready that breed. Sometimes he would choose by mood. I feel quick today. Fetch me a cheetah. Or, I feel strong today. Release a rhino. And whatever he requested, of course, was done. He was ringing down the curtain on an orangutan when the business of the king's health made its ultimate intrusion. It was mid-afternoon, and the prince had been grappling with the giant beast since morning. And finally, after all these hours, the hairy thing was weakening. Again and again, the monkey tried to bite, a sure sign of failure of strength in the arms. The prince warded off the attempted bites with ease, and the ape was heaving at the chest now, desperate for air. The prince made a crab-like step sideways, then another, then darted forward, spun the great beast into his arms, began applying pressure to the spine, this was all taking place in the ape pit where the prince had his pleasure with many simians. From up above now, Count Rugen's voice interrupted. There is news, the count said. From battle, the prince replied, Can it not wait? For how long? asked the count. Crack! 
the orangutan fell like a rag doll. Now, what is all this? The prince replied, stepping past the dead beast, mounting the ladder out of the pit. Your father has had an annual physical, the count said. I have the report. And? Your father is dying. Drat, said the prince. That means I shall have to get married. Chapter 3. The Courtship Four of them met in the great council room of the castle. Prince Humperdinck, his confidant, Count Rugen, his father, aging King Lotharen, and Queen Bella, his evil stepmother. Queen Bella was shaped like a gumdrop and colored like a raspberry. She was easily the most beloved person in the kingdom and had been married to the king long before he began mumbling. Prince Humperdinck was but a child then, and since the only stepmothers he knew were the evil ones from stories, he always called Bella that, or E.S. for short. All right, the prince began when they were all assembled. Who do I marry? Let's pick a bride and get it done. Aging King Lotharen said, I've been thinking it's really getting to be about time for Humperdick to pick a bride. He didn't actually so much say it as mumble it. I be mumble, mumble, humble, bobble, inga, mumble. Queen Bella was the only one who bothered ferreting out his meanings anymore. You couldn't be righter, dear, she said and she patted his royal robes. What did he say? He said, whoever we decide on would be getting a thunderously handsome prince for a lifetime companion. Tell him he's looking quite well himself, the prince returned. We've only just changed miracle men, the queen said. That accounts for the improvement. You mean you fired Miracle Max, Prince Humperdinck said. I thought he was the only one left. No, we found another one up in the mountains, and he's quite extraordinary. Old, of course, but then who wants a young miracle man? Tell him I've changed miracle men. Oh, tell him, sorry, tell him I've changed miracle men, King Lotharen said. It came out, tell mumble, mere rumble, mumble. What did he say? The prince wondered. He said, a man of your importance couldn't marry just any princess. True, true. Prince Humperdinck said. He sighed deeply. I suppose that means Norina. That would certainly be a perfect match politically, Count Rugen allowed. Princess Norina was from Gilder, the country that lay just across the Florin Channel. In Gilder, they put it differently. For them, Florin was the country on the other side of the Channel of Gilder. In any case, the two countries had stayed alive over the centuries mainly by warring on each other. There had been the Olive War, the tuna fish discrepancy, which almost bankrupted both nations, the Roman Rift, which did send them both into insolvency, only to be followed by the Discord of the Emeralds, in which they both got rich again, chiefly by banding together for a brief period and robbing everyone within sailing distance. I wonder if she hunts, though, said Humperdinck. I don't care so much about the personality, just so they're good with a knife. I saw her several years ago, Queen Bella said. She seemed lovely, though hardly muscular. I would describe her more as a knitter than a doer. But again, lovely. Skin? asked the prince. Marbleish? asked the queen. Lips? Uh, number or color? asked the queen. Color, E.S. Rosish? Cheeks the same. Eyes largish, one blue, one green. Hmm, said Humberdink. And form? Hourglassish. Always clothed divinely ish. Divinishly. And of course, famous throughout Gilder for the largest hat collection in the world. Well, let's bring her over here for some state occasions and have a look at her, said the prince. Isn't there a princess in Gilder that would be about the right age? Oh, isn't there a princess, sorry, in Gilder that would be about the right age, said the king. It came out, Mumsis Gobble, a mumble mumble. 
Are you never wrong? said Queen Bella, and she smiled to the weakening eyes of her ruler. What did he say? wondered the prince. That I should leave this very day with an invitation, required, re replied the queen. So began the great visit of the Princess Norina. And it's time for another author's comment. Me again. Of all the cuts in this version, I feel most justified in making this one. Just as the chapters on whaling in Moby Dick can be omitted by all but the most punishment-loving readers, he's right, so the packing scenes that Morgenstern details here are really best left alone. That's what happens for the next 56 and a half pages. The Princess Bride, packing. I include unpacking scenes in this same category. What happens is just this. Queen Bella packs most of her wardrobe, 11 pages, travels to Gilder, two pages, in Gilder, she unpacks five pages, then tenders the invitation to Princess Norina, one page. Princess Norina accepts one page. Then Princess Nor Norina packs all of her clothes and hats, 23 pages. And together, the princess and the queen travel back to Florin for the annual celebration of the founding of Florin City, one page. They reach King Lotharin's castle, where Princess Norina is shown her quarters, one half page and unpacks all the same clothes and hats we've just seen her pack, and one and a half pages before, 12 pages. It's a baffling passage. I spoke to Professor bon Bongiorno of Columbia University, the head of their Florinese department, and he said this was the most deliciously satiric chapter in the entire book. Morgenstern's point, apparently, being simply to show that although Florin considered itself vastly more civilized than Gilder, Gilder was, in fact, the far more sophisticated country, as indicated by the superiority in number <coughs> and quality of the ladies' clothes. I'm not about to argue with a full professor, but if you ever have a really unbreakable case of insomnia, do yourself a favor and start reading Chapter 3 of the uncut version. Anyway, things pick up a bit once the prince and princess meet and spend the day. Norina did have, as advertised, marbleish skin, Rosish lips and cheeks, largish eyes, one blue and one green, hourglassish form, and easily the most extraordinary collection of hats ever assembled. Wide rimmed and narrow, some tall, some not, some fancy, some colorful, some plaid, some plain. She doted on changing hats at every opportunity. When she met the prince, she was wearing one hat. When he asked for her, asked her for a stroll, she excused herself shortly to return wearing another equally flattering. Things went on like this throughout the day, but it seems to me to be a bit too much court etiquette for modern readers, so it's not till the evening meal that I return to the original text. End of author's comments. Dinner was held in the great hall of Lutharan's castle. Ordinarily, they would all have supped in the dining room, but for an event of this importance, that place was simply too small. So tables were placed end to end along the center of the great hall, an enormous drafty spot that was given to being chilly even in the summertime. There were many doors and, a, and giant entryways and the wind gusts sometimes reached gale force. This night was more typical than less. The winds whistled constantly and the candles constantly needed relighting and some of the more daringly dressed ladies shivered. But Prince Humperdinck didn't seem to mind, and in Florin, if he didn't, you didn't either. At 8.23, there seemed every chance of a lasting alliance starting between Florence and Gilder. At 8.24, the two nations were very close to war. What happened was simply this. At 8.23 and five seconds, the main course of the evening was ready for serving. The main course was Essence of Brandied Pig. And you need a lot of it to serve 500 people. So, in order to hasten the serving, a giant double door that led from the kitchen to the great hall was opened. The giant double door was on the north end of the room. The door remained open throughout what followed. The proper wine for Essence of Brandied Pig was in readiness behind the double door that led eventually to the wine cellar. This double door was opened at 8.23 and 10 seconds, in order that the dozen wine stewards could get their kegs quickly to the eaters. This double door, it might be noted, was at the south end of the room. 
At this point, an unusually strong crosswind was clearly evident. Prince Humperdinck did not notice, because at that moment he was whispering with the Princess Norina of Gilder. He was cheek to cheek with her, his head under her wide-brimmed blue-green hat, which brought out the exquisite color of both of her largish eyes. At 8.23 and 20 seconds, King Lotharan made his somewhat belated entrance to the dinner. He was always belated now, had been for years, and in the past people had known to starve before he got there. But of late, meals just began without him, which was fine with him, since his new miracle man had taken, taken him off meals anyways. The king entered through the king's door, a huge hinged thing that only he was allowed to use. It took several servants in excellent condition to work it. It should be reported that the king's door was always in the east side of any room, since the king was, of all people, closest to the sun. What happened then has been variously described as a norther of a sou'wester, depending on where you were seated in the room when it struck. But all hands agree on one thing. At 8.23 and 25 seconds, it was pretty gusty in the great hall. Most of the candles lost their flames and toppled, which was only important because a few of them fell, still burning, into the small kerosene cups that were placed here and there across the banquet table so that the essence of brandied pig could be properly flaming when served. Servants rushed in from all over to put out the flames, and they did a good enough job considering that everything in the room was flying this way and that way, fans and scarves and hats, particularly the hat of Princess Norina. It flew off to the wall behind her, where she quickly retrieved it and put it properly on. That was at 8.23 and 50 seconds. It was too late. At 8.23 and 55 seconds, Prince Humperdinck, Humperdinck rose roaring, the veins in his thick neck etched like hemp. There were still flames in some places, and their redness reddened his already blood-filled face. He looked as he stood there like a barrel on fire. Then he said to Princess Norina of Gilder the five words that brought the nations to the brink. Madam, feel free to flee. And with that, he stormed from the great hall. The time was then 8.24. Prince Humperdinck made his angry way to the balcony above the great hall and stared down at the chaos. The fires were still in places, flaming red. Guests were pouring out through the doors, and Princess Norina, hatted and faint, was being carried by her servants far from view. Queen Bella finally caught up with the prince, who stormed along the balcony, clearly not yet in control. I do wish you hadn't been quite so blunt, Queen Bella said. The prince whirled on her. I'm not marrying any bald princess, and that's that. No one would know, Queen Bella explained. She has hats even for sleeping. I would know, cried the, the prince. Did you see the candlelight reflecting off her skull? But things would have been so good with Gilder, the queen said, addressing herself half to the prince, half to Count Rugen, who now joined them. Forget about Gilder. I'll conquer it sometime. I've been wanting to ever since I was a kid anyways. He approached the queen. People snicker behind your back when you've got a bald wife, and I can do without that, thank you. You'll just have to find someone else. Who? Find me somebody. She should just look nice, that's all. That Norina has no hair. Oh, sorry. That Norina has no hair, King Lutharin said, puffing up to the others. Rumble, mumble, humble. Thank you for pointing that out, dear, said Queen Bella. I don't think Humperdinck will like that, said the king. Rumble, humble, mumble. Then Count Rugen stepped forward. You want someone who looks nice, but what if she's a commoner? The commoner, the better, Prince Humperdinck replied, pacing again. What if she can't, can't hunt, the count went on. I don't care if she can spell, the prince said. Suddenly he stopped and faced them all. I'll tell you what I want, he began. I want someone who is so beautiful that when you see her you say, Wow, that Humperdinck must be some kind of fella to have a wife like that. Search the country. Search the world. Just find her. Count Rugen could only smile. She is already found, he said. 
It was dawn when the two horsemen reined in at the hilltop. Count Rugen rode a splendid black horse, large, perfect, powerful. The prince rode one of his whites. It made, made Rugen's mount seem like a plow puller. She delivers milk in the mornings, Count Rugen said. And she is truly, without question, no possibility of error, beautiful. She was something of a mess when I saw her, the Count admitted, but the potential was overwhelming. A milkmaid? The prince ran the words through his tongue. I don't know that I could wed one of them even under the best of conditions. People might snicker that she was the best I could do. True, the Count admitted. If you prefer, we can ride back to Florence City without waiting. We've come this far, the prince said. We might as well wait. His voice quite simply died. I'll take her, he managed, finally, as Buttercup rode slowly by below them. No one will snicker, I think, the Count said. I must court her now, said the prince. Leave us alone for a minute. He rode the white expertly down the hill. Buttercup had never seen such a giant beast or such a rider. I am your prince and you will marry me, Humperdinck said. Buttercup whispered, I am your servant and I refuse. I am your prince and you cannot refuse. I am your lo loyal servant and I just did. Refusal means death. Kill me then. I am your prince, and I'm not that bad. How could you rather be dead than married to me? Because, Buttercup said, Buttercup said, marriage involves love, and that is not a pastime at which I excel. I tried once, and it went badly, and I am sworn never to love another. Love, said Prince Humperdinck. Who mentioned love? Not me, I can tell you. Look, there must always be a male heir to the throne of Florin. That's me. Once my father dies... There won't be an heir, just a king. That's me again. When that happens, I'll marry and have children until there is a son. So you can either marry me and be the richest and most powerful woman in a thousand miles and give turkeys away at Christmas and provide me a son, or you can die in terrible pain in the very near future. Make up your own mind. I'll never love you. I wouldn't want it if I had it. Then by all means, let us marry. Chapter 4, The Preparations And a note from our author. I didn't even know this chapter existed until I began the good parts version. All my father used to say at this point was, What? With one thing and another, three years passed, and then he'd explain how the day came when Buttercup was officially introduced to the world as the coming queen, and how the great square of the Florence, of Florence City was filled as never before awaiting her introduction. And by then he was into the terrific business dealing with the kidnapping. Would you believe that in the original Morgenstern, this is the longest single chapter in the book? Fifteen pages about how Humperdinck can't marry a common subject, so they fight and argue with the nobles and finally make Buttercup Princess of Hammersmith, which was this little lump of land attached to the rear of King Lothorin's holdings. Then the Miracle Man began improving King Lothorin, and 18 pages are used up in describing the cures. Morgenstern hated doctors and was always bitter when they outlawed miracle men from working in floor and proper. And 72. Count them. 72 pages on the training of a princess. He follows Buttercup day to day, month to month, as she learns all the ways of curtsying and tea pouring and how to address visiting nabobs and like that. All this in a satiric vein, naturally, since Morgenstern hated royalty even more than doctors. But from a narrative point of view, 105 pages, nothing happens except this. With that one thing and another, uh, what with one thing and another, three years passed. Chapter 5. The Announcement. The great square of Florin City was filled as never before, awaiting the introduction of Prince Humperdinck's bride-to-be, Princess Buttercup of Hammersmith. The crowd had begun forming some 40 hours earlier, but up to 24 hours before, there were still fewer than 1,000. But then, as the moment of introduction grew nearer, from across the country, the people came. None had ever seen the princess, but rumors of her beauty were continual and each was less possible than the one before. At noontime, Prince Humperdinck appeared at the balcony of his father's castle and raised his arms. 
The crowd, which by now was at the danger size, slowly quieted. There were stories that the king was dying, and that he was already dead, and that he had been dead long since, and that he was fine. My people, my beloveds, from whom we draw our strength, today is a day of greeting. As you must have heard, my honored father's health is not what it once was. He is, of course, 97, so who can ask more? As you also know, Flora needs a male heir. The crowd began to stir now. It was to be this lady they had heard so much about. In three months, our country celebrates its 500th anniversary. To celebrate that celebration, I shall, on that sundown, take for my wife the Princess Buttercup of Hammersmith. You do not know her yet, but you will meet her now. And he made a sweeping gesture, and the balcony doors flung open, and Buttercup moved out beside him on the balcony. And the crowd, quite literally, gasped. The 21-year-old princess far surpassed the 18-year-old mourner. Her figure faults were gone. The two bony elbow having fleshed out nicely, the opposite pudgy wrist could not have been trimmer. Her hair, which was once the color of autumn, was still the color of autumn, except that before... She had tended it herself, whereas now she had five full-time hairdressers who managed things for her. This was long after hairdressers. In truth, ever since there had been women, there have been hairdressers, Adam being the first. Though the King James scholars do their very best to muddy this point. Her skin was still wintry cream, but now, with two handmaidens assigned to each appendage, and four for the rest of her, it actually, in certain lights, seemed to provide her with a gentle, continual moving as she moved glow. Prince Humperdinck took her hand and held it high as the crowd cheered. That's enough. Mustn't risk overexposure, the prince said, and he started back in, in toward the castle. They have waited some of them so long, Buttercup answered. I would, I would like to walk among them. We do not walk among commoners unless it is unavoidable, the prince said. I have known more than a few commoners in my time, Buttercup told him. They will not, I think, harm me. And with that, she left the balcony, reappeared a moment later on the great steps of the castle, and, quite alone, walked open-armed down into the crowd. Wherever she went, the people parted. She crossed and recrossed the great square, and always ahead of her, the people swept apart to let her pass. Buttercup continued, moving slowly and smiling, alone, like some land messiah. Most of the people there would never forget that day. None of them, of course, had ever been so close to perfection, and the great majority adored her instantly. There were, to be sure, some who, while admitting she was ple pleasing enough, were withholding judgment as to her quality as a queen. And then, of course, there were some who were frankly jealous. Very few of them hated her, and only three of them were planning to murder her. Buttercup naturally knew none of this. She was smiling, and when people wanted to touch her gown, well, let them. And when they wanted to brush their skin against hers, well, let them do that too. She had studied hard to do things royally, and she wanted very much to succeed, so she kept her posture erect and her smile gentle. And that her death was so close would have only made her laugh, but if someone had told her. But in the farthest corner of the great square, in the highest building in the land, deep in the deepest shadow, the man in black stood waiting. His boots were black and leather. His pants were black and his shirt his mask was black, blacker than raven, but blackest of all were his flashing eyes, flashing and cruel and deadly. Buttercup was more than a little weary after her triumph. The touching of the crowds had exhausted her, so she rested a bit, and then towards mid-afternoon she, ch she changed into her riding clothes and went to fetch horse. This was the one aspect of her life that had not changed in the years preceding. She still loved to ride, and every afternoon, whether permitting or not, she rode alone for several hours in the wild land beyond the castle. She did her best thinking then. 
Not that her best thinking ever expanded horizons. Still, she told herself, she was not a dummy either. Slow, so as long as she kept her thoughts to herself, well, where was the harm? As she rode through the woods and streams and heather, her brain was a whirl. The walk through the crowds had moved her, and in a way most strange. For even though she had done nothing for three years now, but trained to be a princess and a queen, today was the first day that she actually understood that it was all soon to be a reality. And I just don't like Humperdinck, she thought. It's not that I hate him or anything. I just never see him. He's always off someplace or playing in the zoo of death. To Buttercup's way of thinking, there were two main problems. Number one, was it wrong to marry with, without like? Number two, if it was, was it too late to do anything about it? The answers to her way of thinking as she rode along were, one, no, and two, yes. It wasn't wrong to marry someone you didn't like. It just wasn't right either. If the whole world did it, that wouldn't be so great. What with everybody kind of grunting at everybody else as the years went by. But of course, not everybody did it, so forget about that. The answer to two was even easier. She had given her word that she would marry, and that would have to be enough. True, he had told her quite honestly that if, if she said no, they, he would have to have her disposed of in order to keep the respect for the crown at its proper level. Still, she could have. Had she chosen, said no. Everyone had told her, since she had become a princess in training, that she was very likely the most beautiful woman in the world. Now she was going to be the richest and most powerful as well. Don't expect too much from life, Buttercup told herself as she rode along. Learn to be satisfied with what you have. Dusk was clothing. Dusk was closing in when Buttercup crested the hill. She was perhaps half an hour from the castle, and her daily ride was three quarters done. Suddenly she reined horse, for standing in the dimness beyond was the strangest trio she had ever seen. The man in front was dark, Sicilian perhaps, with the gentlest face, almost angelic. He had one leg too short, and the makings of a humpback, but he moved forward towards her with surprising speed and nimbleness. The other two remained rooted. The second also, dark, probably Spanish, was erect and slender as the blade of steel that was attached to his side. The third man, mustachioed, perhaps a Turk, was easily the biggest human she had ever seen. A word, the Sicilian said, raising his arms. His smile was more angelic than his face. Buttercup halted. Speak. We are but poor circus performers, the Sicilian explained. It is dark and we are lost. We were told there was a village nearby that might enjoy our skills. You were misinformed, Buttercup told him. There is no one, not for many miles. Then there will be no one to hear you scream, the Sicilian said, and he jumped with frightening agility toward her face. That was all that Buttercup remembered. Perhaps she did scream, but if she did, it was more from terror than anything else, because certainly there was no pain. His hands expertly touched places on her neck, and unconsciousness came. She awoke to the lapping of water. She was wrapped in a blanket, and the giant Turk was putting her in the bottom of a boat. For a moment, she was about to talk. But then, when they began talking, she thought it better to listen. And after she had listened for a moment, it got harder and harder to hear because of the terrible pounding of her heart. I think you should kill her now, the Turk said. The less you think, the happier I'll be, the Sicilian answered. There was sound of ripping cloth. What is that? the Spaniard asked. The same as I attached to her saddle, the Sicilian replied. Fabric from the uniform of an officer of Gilder. I still think she must be found dead on the Gilder frontier or we will not be paid the remainder of our fee. Is that clear enough for you? I just feel better when I know what's going on, that's all, the Turk mumbled. People are always thinking I'm so stupid because I'm big and strong and sometimes drool a little when I get excited. The reason people think you're so stupid, the Sicilian said, is because you are so stupid. It has nothing to do with your drooling. There came the sound of a flapping of sail. 
Watch your heads, the Spaniard cautioned. And then the boat was moving. The people of Florin will not take her death well. I shouldn't think. She has become beloved. There will be war, the Sillian agreed. We have been paid to start it. It's a fine line of work to be expert in. If we do this perfectly, there will be a continual demand for our services. Well, I don't like it all that much, the Spaniard said. Frankly, I wish you had refused. The offer was too high. I don't like killing a girl, the Spaniard said. God does it all the time. If it doesn't bother him, don't let it worry you. Through all this, Buttercup had not moved. The Spaniard said, Let's just tell her we're taking her away for ransom. The Turk agreed. She's so beautiful and she'd go all crazy if she knew. She knows already, the Sicilian, the Sicilian said. She's been awake for every word of this. Buttercup lay under the blanket, not moving. How could he have known that, she wondered. How can you be so sure, the Spaniard asked. The Sicilian senses all, the Sicilian said. Conceited, Buttercup thought. Yes, very conceited, the Sicilian said. He must be a mind reader, Buttercup thought. Are you giving it full sail, the Sicilian said. As much as is safe, the Spaniard answered from the tiller. We have an hour on then, so no risks yet. It will take her horse perhaps 27 minutes to reach the castle. A few minutes more for them to figure out what happened. And since we left an obvious trail, they should be after us within an hour. We should reach the cliffs in 15 minutes more. And with any luck at all, the Gilder frontier at dawn. When she dies, her body should be quite warm when the prince reaches her mutilated form. I only wish we could stay for his grief. It should be Homeric. Why does he let me know his plans, Buttercup wondered. You're going back to sleep now, my lady, the Spaniard said, and his fingers suddenly were touching her temple, her shoulder, her neck, and she was unconscious again. Buttercup did not know how long she was out, but they were still in the boat when she blinked, the blanket shielding her. And this time, without daring to think, the Sicilian would have known it somehow, she threw the blanket aside and dove deep into the Florin Channel. She stayed under for as long as she dared, and then surfaced, starting to swim across the moonless water with every ounce of strength remaining to her. Behind her in the darkness there were cries, Go in, go in, from the Sicilian. I only dog paddle, from the Turk. You, you're better than I am, from the Spaniard. Buttercup continued to leave them behind her. Her arms ached from effort, but she gave them no rest. Her legs kicked and her heart pounded. I can hear her kicking, the Sicilian said. Veer left. Buttercup went into her breaststroke, silently swimming away. Where is she, shrieked the Sicilian. The sharks will get her, don't worry, cautioned the Spaniard. Oh dear, I thought, I wish you hadn't mentioned that, thought Buttercup. Princess, the Sicilian called. Do you know what happens to sharks when they smell blood in the water? They go mad. There is no controlling their wildness. They rip and shred and chew and devour. And I'm in a boat, princess, and there isn't any blood in the water now, so we're both quite safe. But there is a knife in my hand, my lady. And if you don't come back, I'll cut my arms and cut my legs and I'll catch the blood in a cup and I'll fling it as far as I can. And sharks can smell blood in the water for miles and you won't be beautiful for long. Buttercup hesitated, silently treading water. Around her now, although it was surely her imagination, she seemed to be hearing the swish of giant tails. <coughs> Sorry. Come back, and come back now. <coughs> There will be no other warning. Buttercup thought. If I come back, they'll kill me anyways. So what's the difference? The difference is... There he goes doing that again, thought Buttercup. He really is a mind reader. If you come back now, the Sicilian went on, I give you my word as a gentleman and assassin that you will die totally without pain. I assure you, you will get no such promise from the sharks. The fish sounds in the night were closer now. Buttercup began to tremble with fear. She was terribly ashamed of herself, but there it was. She only wished she could see for a moment, for a minute, if there really were sharks, and if he really would cut himself. 
the Sicilian winced out loud. He just caught his arms, lady, the Turk called out. He's catching the blood in a cup now. There must be a half inch of blood on the bottom. The Sicilian winced again. He cut his legs this time, the Turk went on. The cup's getting full. I don't believe them, Buttercup thought. There are no sharks in the water and there's no blood in his cup. My arm is back to throw, the Sicilian said. Call out your location or not. The choice is yours. I am not making a peep, Buttercup decided. Farewell, from the Sicilian. There was the splashing sound of liquid landing on liquid. Then there came a pause. Then the sharks went mad. And now a comment from our author. She does not get eaten by the sharks at this time, my father said. I looked up, I looked up at him. What? You looked like you were getting too involved and bothered, so I thought I would let you relax. Oh, for Pete's sake, I said. You'd think I was a baby or something. What kind of stuff is that? I really sounded put out, but I'll tell you the truth. I was getting a little too involved, and I was glad he told me. I mean, when you're a kid, you don't think. Well, since the blood's called, the prince, or the book's called The Princess Bride, and since we're barely into it, obviously the author's not about to make shark kibble of her, this, uh, of his leading lady. You get hooked on things when you're a youngster, so to any youngsters reading, I'll simply repeat my father's words since they worked so smooth on me. Oh, sorry, since they worked to soothe me. She does not get eaten by the sharks at this time. Back to the story. Then the sharks went mad. All around her, Buttercup could hear them beeping and screaming and thrashing their mighty tails. Nothing can save me, Buttercup realized. I'm a dead cookie. Fortunately, for all concerned, save the sharks, it was around this time that the moon came out. There she is, shouted the Sicilian. And like lightning, the Spaniard turned the boat. And as the boat drew close, the Turk reached out a giant arm and then she was back in the safety of her murderers, while all around them the sharks bumped into each other with wild frustration. Keep her warm, the Spaniard said from the tiller, tossing his cloak to the, cloak to the Turk. Don't catch cold, the Turk said, wrapping Buttercup in the cloak's folds. It doesn't seem to matter all that much, she answered, seeing as you're going to kill me at dawn. He'll do the actual work, the Turk said indicating the Sicilian, who was wrapping cloth around his cuts. We'll just hold you. Hold your stupid tongue, the Sicilian commanded. The Turk immediately hushed. I don't think he's so stupid, Buttercup said. And I don't think you're so smart either, with all your throwing blood in the water. That's not what I would call grade A thinking. It worked, didn't it? You're back, aren't you? The Sicilian crossed towards her. Once women are sufficiently frightened, they scream. But I didn't scream. The moon came out, answered Buttercup somewhat triumphantly. The Sicilian struck her. Enough of that, the Turk said then. The tiny humpback looked dead at the giant. Do you want to fight me? I don't think you do. No, sir, the Turk mumbled. No, but don't use force, please. Force is mine. Strike me if you feel the need. I won't care. The Sicilian returned to the other side of the boat. She would have screamed, he said. She was about to cry out. My plan was ideal, as all my plans are ideal. It was the moon's ill timing that robbed me of perfection. He scowled unforgivingly at the yellow wedge above them. Then he stared ahead. There, oh, there, the Sicilian pointed, the cliffs of insanity. And there they were. Rising straight and sheer from the water, a thousand feet into the night, they provided the most direct route between Florin and Gilder, but no one ever used them, sailing instead the long way many miles around. Not that the cliffs were impossible to scale, two men were known to have climbed them in the last century alone. Sail straight for the steepest part, the Sicilian commanded. The, S the Spaniard said, I was. Buttercup did not understand. Going up the cliffs could hardly be done, she thought, and no one had ever mentioned secret passages through them. Yet here they were, sailing closer and closer to the mighty rocks, now surely less than a quarter mile away. For the first time, the Sicilian allowed himself a smile. All is well, 
I was afraid your little jaunt in the water was going to cost me too much time. I had allowed a, a half hour of safety. There must still be 50 minutes of it left. Oh, an hour, sorry, an hour of safety. There must still be 50 minutes of it left. We are miles ahead of anybody and safe, safe, safe. No one could be following us yet, the Spaniard asked. No one, the Sicilian assured him. It would be inconceivable. Absolutely inconceivable? Absolutely, totally, and in all other ways, inconceivable, the Sicilian reassured, reassured him. Why do you ask? No reason, the Spaniard replied. It's only just that I happen to look back and something's there. They all whirled. Something was indeed there. Less than a mile behind them, across the moonlight, was another sailing boat. Small, painted, what looked like black, with a giant sail that billowed black in the night, and a single man at the tiller. A man in black. The Spaniard looked at the Sicilian. It must be just some local fisherman out for pleasure, a pleasure cruise alone at night through shark-infested waters. There's probably a more logical explanation, the Sicilian said. But since no one in Gilder could know, uh, could know yet what we've done, and no one in Florin could have gotten here so quickly, he is definitely not. However, however much it may look like it, following us. It is coincidence and nothing more. He is gaining on us, the Turk said. That is also inconceivable, the Sicilian said. Before I stole this boat we are in, I made many inquiries as to what was the fastest ship on all of Florin Channel, and everyone agreed it was this one. You're right, the Turk agreed, staring back. He isn't gaining on us. He's just getting closer, that's all. It's the angle we're looking at from and we're looking from and nothing more, said the Sicilian. Buttercup could not take her eyes from the great black sail. Surely the three men she was with frightened her, but somehow, for reasons she could never begin to explain, the man in black frightened her more. All right, look sharp, the Sicilian said, and just a drop of edginess in his voice. The cliffs of insanity were very close now. The Spaniard maneuvered the craft expertly, which was not easy, and the, the waves were rolling in towards the rocks now, and the spray was blinding. Buttercup shielded her eyes and put her head straight back, staring up into the darkness towards the top, which seemed shrouded and out of reach. Then the humpback bounded forward, and as the ship reached the cliff face, he jumped up and suddenly... There was a rope in his hand. Buttercup stared in silent astonishment. The rope, thick and strong, seemed to travel all the way up the cliffs. As she watched, the Sicilian pulled at the rope again and again, and it held firm. It was attached to something at the top, a giant rock, a towering tree, something. Fast now, the Sicilian ordered. If he is following us, which of course is not within the realm of human experience, but if he is... We've got to reach the top and cut the rope off before he can climb up after us. Climb? Buttercup said. I would never be able to. Hush, the Sicilian ordered her. Get ready, he ordered the Spaniard. Sink it, he ordered the Turk. And then everyone got busy. The Spaniard took a rope, tied Buttercup's hands and feet. The Turk raised a great leg and stomped down at the center of the boat, which gave way immediately and began to sink then the Turk went to the rope and took it in his hands. Load me, said the Turk. The Spaniard lifted Buttercup and draped her body around the Turk's shoulders. Then he tied himself to the Turk's waist. Then the Sicilian hopped, clung to the Turk's neck. All aboard, the Sicilian said. This was before trains, but the expression comes originally from carpenters loading lumber, and this was well after carpenters. With that, the Turk began to climb. It was at least a thousand feet, and he was carrying the three. But he was not worried. When it came to power, nothing worried him. When it came to reading, he got knots in the middle of his stomach, 
and when it came to writing, he broke out in a cold sweat. And when addition was mentioned, or worse, long division, he always changed the subject right away. But strength had never been his enemy. He could take the kick of a horse on his chest and not fall backwards. He could take a hundred pound flour sack between his legs and scissor it open without thinking. He had once held an elephant aloft using only the muscles in his back. But his real might lay in his arms. There had never, <clears throat> not in a thousand years, been arms to match Fezix, for that was his name. The arms were not only gargantuan and totally obedient and surprisingly quick, but they were also, and this is why he never worried, tireless. If you gave him an axe and told him to chop down a forest, his legs might give out from having to support so much weight for so long, or the axe might shatter from the punishment of killing so many trees, but Fezzik's arms would be as fresh as tomorrow as, fresh tomorrow as today. And so... Even with the Sicilian on his neck and the princess around his shoulders and the Spaniard at his waist, Fezzik did not feel in the least bit put upon. He was actually quite happy, because it was only when he was requested to use his might that he felt he wasn't a bother to everybody. Up he climbed, arm over arm, arm over arm, 200 feet now above the water, 800 feet to go. <clears throat> More than any of them, the Sicilian was afraid of heights. All of his nightmares, and they were never far from when he slept, dealt with falling. So this terrifying assumption, ascension was the most difficult for him, perched as he was on the neck of the giant, or should have been most difficult, <clears throat> but he would not allow it. From the beginning, when as a child he realized his humped body would never conquer words, worlds, he relied on his mind. He trained it, fought it brought it to heel. So now, 300 feet in the night and rising higher, while he should have been trembling, he was not. Instead, he was thinking of the man in black. <clears throat> there was no way anyone could have been quick enough to follow them. And yet, from some devil's world, that billowing black sail had appeared. How? How? The Sicilian flogged his mind to find an answer. But he only found failure. In wild frustration, he took a deep breath and, in spite of his terrible fears, he looked back down toward the dark water. The man in black was still there, sailing like lightning toward the cliffs. He could not have been more than a quarter mile from them now. Faster, the Sicilian commanded. I'm sorry, the Turk answered meekly. I thought I was going faster. Lazy, lazy, spurred the Sicilian. I'll never improve, the Turk answered, <clears throat> but his arms began to move faster than before. I cannot see too well because your feet are locked around my face, he went on. So could you please tell me if we're halfway yet? A little over, I should think, said the Spaniard from his position around the giant's waist. You're doing wonderfully, Fezzik. <clears throat> Thank you, said the giant. And he's closing on the cliffs, added the Spaniard. No one had to ask who he was. Six hundred feet now. The arms continued to pull over and over. Six hundred and twenty feet. Six hundred and fifty. Now, faster than ever, seven hundred. He's left his boat behind, the Spaniard said. He's jumped onto our rope. He's starting up after us. I can feel him, Fezzik said his body's weight on the rope. He'll never catch up, the Sicilian cried. Inconceivable. You keep using that word, the Spaniard, Sp Spaniard snapped. I don't think it means what you think it does. How fast is he at climbing, Fezzik said. I am frightened, was the Spaniard's reply. The Sicilian gathered his courage again and looked down. The man in black seemed almost to be flying. Already he had cut their lead a hundred feet, perhaps more. I thought you were supposed to be so strong, the Sicilian shouted. I thought you were this great mighty thing, and yet he gains. I am carrying three people, Fezzik explained. He has only himself and 
Excuses are the refuge of cowards. The Sicilian interrupted. He looked down again. The man in black had gained another hundred feet. He looked up now. The cliff tops were beginning to come into view. <clears throat> Perhaps a hundred and fifty feet more, and they were safe. Tied, hand and foot, sick with fear, Buttercup wasn't sure she, what she wanted to happen, except this much she knew. She didn't want to go through anything like it again. Fly, Fezzik! The Sicilian screamed, a hundred feet to go! Fezzik flew. His, he cleared his mind of everything but ropes and arms and fingers, and his arms pulled and his fingers gripped and the rope held taut. He's over halfway, the Spaniard said. Halfway to doom is where he is, the Sicilian said. We're fifty feet from safety, and once we're there and I untie the rope, he allowed himself to laugh. Forty feet, Fezzik pulled. Twenty. Ten. It was over. Fezzik had done it. They had reached the top of the cliffs, and first the Sicilian jumped off, and then the Turk removed the princess, and as the Spaniard untied himself, he looked back over the cliffs. The man in black was, more, was no more than 300 feet away. It seems a shame, the Turk said, looking down alongside the Spaniard. Such a climber deserves better than... He stopped talking then. The Sicilian had untied the rope from its knots around the oak. The rope seemed almost alive, the greatest of all water serpents, heading at, the la heading at last for home. It whipped across the cliff tops, spiraled into the moonlit channel. The Sicilian was roaring now, and he kept at it until the Spaniard said, He did it. Did what? Oh, did what? The humpback came scurrying to the cliff edge. He released the rope in time, the Spaniard said. See? He pointed down. The man in black was hanging in space clinging to the sheer rock face 700 feet above the water. The Sicilian watched, fascinated. You know, he said, since I've made a study of death and dying, and I'm a great expert, it might interest you to know that he will be dead long before he hits the water. The fall will do it, not the crash. The man in black dangled helpless in space, clinging to the cliffs with both hands. Oh, how rude we're being, the Sicilian said. Then, turning to Buttercup, I'm sure you'd like to watch. He went to her and brought her, still tied hand and foot, so that she could watch the final pathetic struggle of the man in black 300 feet below. Buttercup closed her eyes and turned away. Shouldn't we be going, the Spaniard asked. I thought you were telling us how important time was. It is, it is, the Sicilian nodded but I just can't miss a death like this. I could stage one of these every week and sell tickets. I could get out of the assassina assassination business entirely. Look at him. Do you think his life is passing before his eyes? That's what the books say. He has very strong arms, Fezzik commented, to hold on so long. He can't hold on much longer, the Sicilian said. He has to fall soon. It was at that moment that the man in black began to climb. Not quickly, of course, and not without great effort, but still there was no doubt that he was, in spite of the sheerness of the cliffs, heading in an upward direction. Inconceivable, the Sicilian cried. The, Sus the Spaniard whirled on him. Stop saying that word. It was inconceivable that, everyone, that anyone could follow us, but when we looked behind, there was a man in black. It was inconceivable that anyone could sail as fast as we could sail, and yet he gained on us. Now this too is inconceivable, but look, and the Spaniard pointed down through the night, see how he rises. The man in black was indeed rising. Somehow, in an almost miraculous way, his fingers were finding holds in the crevices, and he was now perhaps fifteen feet closer to the top, farther from death. The Sicilian advanced on the Spaniard now, his wild eyes glittering at the insubordination. I have the keenest mind that has ever turned to unlawful pursuits, he began. So when I tell you something, it is not guesswork, it is fact. And the fact is that the man in black is not following us. A more logical explanation would be that he is simply... An ordinary sailor, sailor, sailor 
who dabbles in mountain climbing as a hobby who happens to have the same general final destination as we do. That certainly satisfies me, and I hope it satisfies you. In any case, we cannot take the risk of his seeing us with the princess, and therefore, one of you must kill him. Shall I do it? the Turk wondered. The Sicilian shook his head. No, Fezzik, he said. I need your strength to carry the girl. Pick her up now, and let us hurry along. He turned to the Spaniard. We'll be heading directly for the frontier of Gilder. Catch up as quickly as you can once he's dead. The Spaniard nodded. The Sicilian hobbled away. The Turk hoisted the princess, began following the humpback. Just before he lost sight of the Spaniard, he turned and hollered, Catch up quickly. Don't I always? The Spaniard waved. Farewell, Fezzik. Farewell, Inigo, the Turk replied. And then he was gone, and the Spaniard was alone. Inigo moved to the cliff edge and knelt with his customary quick grace. 250 feet below him now, the man in black continued his painful climb. Inigo lay flat, staring down, trying to pierce the moonlight and find the climber's secret. For a long while, Inigo did not move. He was a good learner, but not a particularly fast one, so he had to study. Finally, he realized that somehow, by some mystery, the man in black was making fists and jamming them into the rocks and using them for support. Then he would reach up with his other hand until he found a high split in the rock and make another fist and jam it in. Whenever he could find support for his feet, he would use it, but mostly it was the jammed fists that made the climbing possible. Inigo marveled. What a truly extraordinary adventurer this man in black must be. He was close enough now for Inigo to realize that the man was masked, a black hood covering all but his features. Another outlaw? Perhaps. Then why should they have to fight, and for what? Inigo shook his head. It was a shame that such a fellow must die. But he had his orders. So there it was. Sometimes he did not like the Sicilian's commands. But what could he do? Without the brains of the Sicilian, he, Inigo, would never be able to command jobs of this caliber. The Sicilian was a master planner. Inigo was a creature of the moment. The Sicilian said, kill him. So why waste sympathy on the man in black? Someday, someone would kill Inigo, and the world would not stop to mourn. He stood now, quickly jumping to his feet, his blade-thin body ready, ready for action. Only the man in black was still many feet away. There was nothing to do but wait for him. Inigo hated waiting. So, to make the time more pleasant, he pulled from the scabbard his great, his only love, the six-fingered sword. How it danced in the moonlight. How glorious and true. Inigo brought it to his lips and with all the fervor in his great Spanish heart, kissed the medal. <laughs>